Well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad you are here. It is dark and rainy outside, but we are honored to have you with us. Those who are joining us here in the worship center, those who are joining us online, it is so great to have you join with us today to worship the Lord and to sing his praises. There's a lot of things happening in our church. We continue to evaluate how to do ministry as we go forward throughout these next few weeks. Let me tell you a few things that are going on right now. And then we will have our time of singing praise and worship to the Lord. We want you to know that we want to say especially happy Father's Day to all the dads who are out there. Dads who are watching. My dad who's watching. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Please know about our website. <clears throat> a lot of helpful information for you there. If you received a worship guide here in the room, there's a place where you can tear off a section and give us a little bit of your information. We'd love to say hello to you and welcome you to our church. You can do the same thing online at the website firstmelissa.com slash myinfo. Also at the website, if you'd like to know what membership looks like in our church, how to become part of our church family, it is firstmelissa.com slash welcome home. And that tear-off slip in your worship guide is the same as the email address, prayer at firstmelissa.com. If, if you have a need in your family, we can pray with you and pray for you, prayer at firstmelissa.com. Now we have started back some of our in-person small groups. Some are meeting right now. Others will meet in the next couple of hours of the day. So if you'd like to be a part of our small groups in person or online or in our local home, We'd love to help you get involved with that as well. Please know that if you're here in the room with us, there are giving boxes by the exit doors here and in the foyer. You can drop off your tithes and offerings by those offering boxes or those information slips as well. And if you prefer to give online, the website is firstmelissa.com slash give. And we thank you for being faithful with your tithes and offerings. And it's easy at firstmelissa.com slash give. Our friend Kevin is not with us today, but Christy Isaacs will be leading us today. And don't tell Kevin that I like Christy more than Kevin, okay? But I'm so glad that Christy is with us today and she's going to lead us in worship after we pray. So let's bow. Our Father, we love you and we bless you and we say thank you for the chance to be in your house today. Father, our world is full of anguish and sorrow and fear. And we come to you right now because we need you. We pray for spiritual revival in our country. We pray for hope. We pray for encouragement. We pray for wisdom for our leaders. We pray the people who know and love you will stand for righteousness in the middle of these days. God, as we sing your praises, as we study your word, would you speak to our hearts today? We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. Those in the room, those online, let's stand. Christy, please. All right. We're glad you're here this morning. And uh, before we sing our song, uh, I wanted to share a, a, a psalm with you. So this is part of Psalm 24. And it says, lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, O you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. So I just wanted to start off with that and just, we're here to worship the King. So let's just open our hearts and praise him this morning.
Just tell him you love him this morning. Um, so I was preparing for today. Um, in my mind, I was going through the songs and kind of this whole King of Glory scripture that I shared with you just resonated in my heart. And it just, can you imagine the King of Glory coming here? You know, it just, um, I don't know what I would do. What would you do if the King of Glory, he's here. But like, what if we saw him come in, you know? And I just, I also thought about Paul and Silas. And when they were thrown in prison for preaching the word, what did they do? They praised God. They gave praises to him. And what that did was that allowed God to just break the chains. He loosed the chains, opened the doors. It wasn't an accident. Nobody left those things undone. God did it. And so when we worship the, the Lord, that's what, we're, that's what we're doing. We're allowing him to work miracles in our lives. And so when we sing this song, um, you might be in a, in a valley. You might be in a low place. Praise him. Praise him for where you are. And if you're on the mountaintop right now, and if you're in a good place and things are going great, remember the valleys that you've been in because that was where he worked and was evident the most. At least in my life, I know that when I've had hard times, that's when I relied on God the most. But it's important to not forget those things. So as we sing this song, wherever you're at, thank him. Thank him for all that he is, all that he's done, and worship him this morning.
it again. Sing it to him. Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit. Troubles awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Grace is with your presence. You are the King of glory. You are mighty in battle. And you are our rock and our foundation that we can cling to when we're in the struggles of this life. And I thank you, God, that, that I know that I can, I, I can trust that. I can put every ounce of faith that I have in you and you alone. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you... That you are in this place this morning. Lord, we give this day to you. Lord, speak to our hearts and draw us closer to you every second of this day, Lord Jesus. Praise you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. On Father's Day, let's talk about a dad who took his family somewhere no one had ever been before. A dad who says to his family, we're about to do something because God asked us to and it's never happened before, but we're going to trust him. Our series is called Epic Tales. We continue a brand new teaching series we began last week telling you some of the most famous Bible stories, some of the stories you probably heard as a child and you wonder, do they have anything to say to me today? Well, I'm going to invite you to go to the very first book of your whole Bible, the book of Genesis, and we're going to tell you a story that you know, Noah and the ark. Noah, one of the most interesting figures in your scriptures. We're going to look at several chapters in the book of Genesis, starting in chapter 6, so I invite you to find your way to the book of Genesis, the very first book of your whole Bible, Genesis chapter 6. And of course, we're going to talk about a flood, a worldwide flood, the great flood. And if you talk to scientists and archaeologists from different cultures, different centuries, almost all scientists agree that there was a huge flood thousands of years ago. Look at the fossil records. Look at all of these things that are involved in science, carbon dating and all of these systems. And you'll notice there is almost universal consensus that there was a huge flood that greatly affected the globe. The question is why? What caused it? Well, there, science is all over the place. Some talk about an asteroid that crashed into the earth. Others talk about a volcano that erupted. Plate tectonics is another theory that the ground kept shifting and that's how the continents were spread out. Or you can go with the Genesis theory that there was a God who created this world and God who created people who then rejected their creator. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6 starting in verse 5. The year is about 2,500 B.C., so 4,500 years ago. And you'll recall that in Genesis 1, we meet Adam and Eve. That's the first generation of the human race. We are now in the 10th generation of the human race, from Adam and Eve to Noah. It says in Genesis 6, Yahweh, the Lord, saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and the and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. We often talk about our hearts being in grief, but do we ever think about the heart of God himself being in grief? Because the people that he loved, the people that he made in his own image, in just 10 generations have totally walked away from him. 
The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. Don't read this as to say God made a mistake because the perfect heavenly father doesn't make a mistake. And he's also not surprised because the all-knowing God is never surprised, but he can be heartbroken because of sin, because of turning away from him. Verse eight, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. He was a righteous man called Sadiq in Hebrew. He was blameless, Tamim in Hebrew. He was righteous, he was devoted, he was committed to God, blameless in his time. And it says, Noah walked with God. And if you wanna know what this means, some people think this means he has a relationship with God and he has a communication with God, and it does. But this is the actual literal, literal verb for walk. He walked with God every step of his life. He was walking with God. So you have two situations. You've got the hearts of men were evil, and you've got Noah was righteous and blameless. And the question that we must ask is, are God's people today different from our culture? Are we distinct from the world around us because we walk with God? Verse 10, and we'll show you a family tree on the screen. Verse 10, Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is the family tree from Adam. And if you're looking at your notes that you downloaded online or on the screen, you see it goes all the way from Adam. There are Many, many children that Adam and Eve had, but only three of them are named, three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth. Cain kills Abel. So that family tree stops, obviously. So you have the family tree of Cain on the left side of the screen and the family tree of Seth on the right side of this chart. And if you go down all these generations, you get to Noah. And it just said in verse 10 that he has three sons named Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now we're in verse 11. It says, the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. Remember, this is 4,500 years ago in the 10th generation of human history. And what does the sentence, the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence, sound like? Today, exactly today, God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. So God said, verse 14, to Noah, make for yourself an ark. The Hebrew word is tibah. And actually you know this word because we're in Genesis, but if you went to the next book, Exodus, you read chapter two, you read another famous story about another famous character. His name is Moses, who was born and his mother put him in a basket and put him in the river. And the word for basket is tiba, ark. It's the same word. It's a container. It's, a, it's a, an enclosure. So God said, make for yourself an ark. Now this is going to be a boat, but has this more general sense of a, an item that holds something. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Very specific instructions God gives to Noah. Make the ark with rooms, compartments. Cover it inside and out with pitch, tar, so it'll float. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark is to be 300 cubits. Do you remember what a cubit is? It is the length from the end of your fingers to your elbow. It's a cubit. Well, everybody has a different length, of course. So they began to standardize them over the generations. And it ranged from 18 inches to 21 inches over the different generations. But that's a cubit. You always had your tape measure with you. You're to make it a length of 300 cubits. That's somewhere between 450 and 500 feet long. The breadth, 50 cubits. Now you're talking... 75 to 90 feet, and height, 30 cubits, 45 to 55 feet. This is a big vessel. 
God, again, giving instructions, you shall make a window for the ark, finish it to a cubit from the top, set the door of the ark in the side of it, and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. So we've got a blueprint, three levels, the height, the width, the depth, all of these instructions. So people begin to ask, what did it look like or how big was it? So we've got some photographs we'll put on the screen for you. There are three arrows pointing at the right side on that photograph. This is a 1 to 75 scale. On the top, the arrow is pointing to a big black vessel. That is a model, 1 to 75 scale, of Noah's Ark. Then on the right side, it's pointing to a replica, same scale, of one of the ships of Christopher Columbus. And then further right is a railway boxcar. So these are scale drawings or scale models of the size of this thing. And if you do a little math, you realize that this ark was designed to be built on a scale of 50 cubits to 300 cubits or 1 to 6 ratio and naval scientists tell us today that the best way to make a floating vessel is a 1 to 6 ratio. God already knew what he was doing of course and this gives you a sense of the size. Now what does it look like inside? Well this is a 1 to 32 scale so it's a bigger scale and it has three decks. It has a window at the very top as you can see, different rooms, different compartments so this is a view inside of what the ark could have looked like. Now the question then becomes, because you may already know what's coming, God's going to tell Noah how many animals to bring. And people begin to wonder, could this have been big enough to hold all the animals? Well, scientists have determined that if you take all the animals in the world and you find the average size, the middle size of all animals, it's a sheep. Half are bigger, half are smaller. It's the average size. One railroad car can hold 240 sheep. And we just showed you the model of how much bigger this is than one railway car. So this author's theory is that they had about 40,000 animals. I'm trying to think of how many species there were. Because you didn't differentiate from this kind of hummingbird and this kind of hummingbird, okay? How many different species? They think it was about 40,000 animals. You put all those together, the average size of a sheep, that would take about 167 railroad cars worth of capacity and the ark was 569 railroad cars of capacity. So all the room for all the animals, according to this theory, only took up 30% of how big this ark is, leaving 70% left over for living areas for Noah's family, for food and supplies and all the things that they would have to bring with them. Continuing to hear the instructions from God, Genesis 6, verse 17, God says to Noah, behold, I, even I am bringing the flood of the water upon the earth to destroy all flesh and which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. Obviously, the fish will survive the flood. But God says, I will establish my covenant with you. God says, I am making promises to you. These are not two-way promises. These are one-way promises from God to Noah. You shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. So you've got Noah and a wife. You've got three sons and three wives. Eight people will enter the ark together. Who else will enter? Verse 19, of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. Why? Because God's going to not only repopulate the earth with people, he's going to repopulate the earth with animals after this is over. They shall be made male and female. Of the birds after their kind, the animals, every creeping thing of the ground, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Isn't it pretty cool that God didn't make Noah go find all these things? He had them delivered to him. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible. Gather it to yourself. You need food for you, the people, and for them, the animals. Now, maybe the most important verse in this whole story is Genesis 6.22. Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Or another translation, 
Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Boy, do I wish they could say that about me. Maybe you wish they could say about you, you did everything exactly as God commanded you. Of course, we're reading the book of Genesis. If you went way forward in your Bible to that hall of fame of faith in Genesis, I mean, I'm sorry, in Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Noah is a man of faith who did everything that God commanded him. Now we're in chapter 7, Genesis, verse 1. The Lord said to Noah, enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone have I seen to be righteous before me in this time. Now we learned a moment ago you're supposed to take two of every kind, but there's actually a caveat. Look, you shall take two, uh, take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and female. So kosher or clean animals, you take seven twos, okay, seven pairs. And of the animals that are not clean, the unkosher animals, you take one pair, a male and female. Also the birds of the sky by seven, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days, I will bring rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. And again, look what it says. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. There is a lot of debate, and I think it's a very strong argument to say that by the time Noah has been commanded to enter the ark and God says, I will send rain on the earth, a lot of people read the scriptures and determine it has never rained before. Never rained before. There was a mist. There was dew on the ground that kept the plants watered. And God says, I'm going to do something that you've never seen before, but you need to trust me anyway. And, oh, by the way, how old was our friend Noah? Verse 6, Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. Now, I just want you to know that when I am 600 years old, I hope I'm not called to this kind of a project. Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark, remember, eight people because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, they went into the ark by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. So the next big question becomes, how long did it take to build the ark? Well, Noah's first mentioned in chapter 5, right before we started reading, verse 32, he's 500 years old. When he enters the ark in chapter 7, he is 600 years old. So... Some people assume that that means he, it took him 100 years to build the ark, okay? Others talk about the fact that Genesis chapter 6 talks about 120 years. So there's a debate. Was it 100 years? Was it 120 years? The point is, it took him a very long time to build this ark, which meant he had to remain faithful to God for a very long time. He had to be faithful to God in spite of all of his neighbors walking by and saying, what are you doing? I'm building an ark. What's an ark? Well, it's like a boat. Okay, why do you need a boat? Because it's going to rain. And the neighbor's saying, what is rain? As it rains. Timing is everything, you understand? <laughs> Th see, Noah, that's what I... So, 100 years, you didn't give up. 100 years, you didn't stop believing. 100 years, you didn't say, God, I'm really tired of this. And so it's time. Verse 10 of chapter 7. It came about after the seven days, after that final warning... The water of the flood came upon the earth 
in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, look how specific it is, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst opened, meaning there was water from below, like springs and fountains, but also the flood gates of the sky. There's water coming from both directions. And the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, you know that phrase probably, 40 days and 40 nights, and you think that's the entirety of the story. However, we're going to do some more math to show you that it's a lot longer than that. Continue, verse 13. On the very same day, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, the three sons, and Noah's wife and the three wives of the sons with them, they entered the ark, they and every beast after its kind, all the cattle... After their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered male and female of all flesh entered as God had commanded him. And the Lord closed the door, closed it behind him. God is involved in this whole story, telling him, that a flood is coming because of judgment on sin, telling him what to build and exactly how to build it, when to enter it. And God says, I'm still with you. I haven't left. I'm going to be right here. I'm shutting the door for you. Then, now we're in verse 17, the flood came upon the earth for 40 days. The water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth. The ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered, which means this is rightly called a global flood, not a regional flood. All the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered, and the water prevailed 15 cubits higher, 22 to 27 feet higher than the mountains were covered. The amount of water we cannot imagine. And I mentioned earlier that almost all of science agrees on the history of a huge flood that impacted everything. All your dating systems, all the ways that people try to say the world is billions of years old, which I do not think it is, all of the dating systems, all of science was affected by a flood in ways that we cannot comprehend. And this is the story. Continuing now, verse 21, chapter 7. All flesh that moved on the earth perished. Birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms on the earth and all mankind of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. He, God, blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land. Now we read that And you know what it ought to do? It ought to break our hearts. A hundred years or so that Noah was building the ark and people said, why are you doing this? And he said, because God's going to send a flood. Why? Because people have turned away from him. And remember, we are ten generations into human history. Judgment is a real thing. Sin is a real thing. The holiness of God is a real thing. And it ought to sadden us that the percentage of people who loved God and the percentage of people who rejected God, it should break our hearts. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the land from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left together with those who were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth. 150 days. I thought it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Well, it did, but after it stopped raining, all that water's still there. So water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. Now, we just read about the fact that all these lives were taken, and we think that sounds cruel. It sounds vengeful. And we need to be reminded of a concept about the wrath of of God. We speak about the mercy and grace of God often, and we should, but what does it mean to talk about the wrath of God? Let me show you Romans chapter 1, verse 18 on the screen. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness 
and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. In other words, if you and I are really honest and we look at the creation around us, we must admit somebody big and powerful and brilliant designed all of this. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. You and I live in a world where intellectual honesty will admit this world had to be created by someone brilliant and powerful. And yet we refuse to believe that or give thanks to him. And God says, if you reject me, there's a consequence for that. But we say, what about the patience of God? God is exceedingly patient. See that it took 100 years of God offering the chance for repentance. So what do you do about the wrath of God? Well, I'll show you two verses on the screen from also the book of Romans. This is chapter 5 and chapter 8. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us while we were yet sinners. Jesus Christ died for us. Not after we had cleaned ourselves up, but while we were away from him, Jesus died in our place. In Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. That's the consequence of my rejecting God. It's a choice that I make to look at the creator of the universe and say, I don't want anything to do with you. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we remember the tragedy of the flood and the loss of life, but what's more tragic is the people who turned their back on the one true God. Let's keep going. We're now in chapter 8 of Genesis. Don't miss the phrase, God remembered. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and the cattle that were with him in the ark. God caused a wind to pass over the earth. The water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed. So the water that was gushing up stopped, and the water coming down in rain stopped. The rain from the sky was restrained, and the water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the water decreased. Verse 4, in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. We'll talk about that in a second. The water decreased steadily because you've still got water everywhere, even though more is not coming. The water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. So you've got a peak of a mountain showing through. That's all the dry land you've got so far. It's still you can't live there yet. Oh, by the way, if you like to read your news, here's a news story. Both of these are Fox News Online. One's published in 2015. One's published in 2019. There is some serious archaeology going on on a place called Mount Ararat in the country of Turkey in the mountains. They believe... That that's the spot where the ark still sits even to this day. So there's a lot of people trying to be, you know, archaeologists and discoverers and treasure hunters and all of those folks trying to find that on Mount Ararat. We're still in chapter 8, verse 6. Then it came about at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, he sent out a raven, a bird. It flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. So it just kept flying around. Then Noah sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned into the ark. The water was on the surface of the earth. Noah put out his hand, took her, the dove, and brought it back into the ark. So he waited seven more days. We're in verse 10. He again sent out the dove from the ark. What is he trying to do? See if there's dry land out there. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. 
there's vegetation, there's dry ground. So Noah knew the water was abated from the earth. He waited another seven days, sent out the dove. She did not return to him again. Now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. On the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. So you've got some very specific dates. And if you put them all into a chart together, like these folks did, and I know the text is very small, but if you put all of these dates and lengths of time together and add it all up, look at the red circle. 377 days from getting on the ark to getting off the ark. Is it 40 days and 40 nights? Well, yes, but it's not just 40 days and 40 nights. We're talking more than a year that this has gone on. We're still going, chapter 8, verse 15. It's time to start over. God says to Noah, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons' wives with You bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals, every creeping thing on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth, be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. And what does Noah do the first moment he gets onto dry land? Verse 20, Noah built an altar to the Lord. It was a time of worship and thanksgiving that you kept your promise. Noah built an altar to the Lord, took of every clean animal, every clean bird, and offered a burnt offering on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So now we get to chapter 9. In verse 1 of chapter 9, God said to Noah and his sons, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And that is exactly what God said in Genesis 1 to generation number 1, Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now we're in generation 10 and then 11, his children, and they have to restart the human race. And just like Adam and Eve were given dominion over the garden and the animals, it's the same reset. So verse 2 of chapter 9, God says to Noah, The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground, all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give to you as I have given the green plant." We should take care of God's creation. We should take care of animals and the plants and the nature. But understand, they're not the same in God's eyes as people are. People are created in the image of God. And we are to take care of God's creation, but we're not equal to the nature. We are special in his eyes. There is a restriction in verse 4. God says, only you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is its blood. Don't rip apart animals and, and, and be cruel and they're still bleeding and, and there's still life and their heart's still pumping and you eat them raw. Don't, don't be a savage, okay? Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require it. From every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever shed man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed for in the image of God he made man. Remember? Generation number two, we already had the first murder. One brother kills the other brother. So God values life. And he says, you should too. As for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. And as we come toward the end of the story, now we're in chapter 9, verse 8. God spoke to Noah and his sons and said, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you. Again, it's a promise from God to these people and to your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, birds, cattle, beasts of the earth, all that comes out of the ark, every beast of the earth. God says, I establish my covenant with you. All flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. Verse 12, God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I'm making between me and you and every living creature. 
For all successive generations, I set my bow in the cloud, my rainbow in the cloud. And it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow, the rainbow, will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. So we're talking about the rainbow in the sky. And there's science behind it, the water reflecting the light and all of these things. And we have a photograph of a beautiful rainbow. And I am well aware that this has been adopted as a political movement and a political symbol for an agenda. I'm aware of all of that. I'm just telling you it's God's design as his covenant to his people that I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. And this is to be a reminder, not of a political movement or a social strategy, but of a covenant between God and man. Verse 16, God says, when the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And we come to the end of the story. Verse 18, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the whole earth was populated. And again, we have a family tree with lots of names on it. Very top line, you've got Noah, his three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. One of the sons of Ham is a guy named Canaan. You probably know that the land of Israel before the people of Israel lived in it was called the land of Canaan because it was owned by a guy named Canaan, a grandson of Noah. And all the human race, all of us, came forth from these three parts of the family tree. And if you continue the next chart through the line of Shem, all the way down to Abraham, and then you got Isaac and Jacob, and you've got all the way through the line of the covenant people. And you've probably heard the term anti-Semitism, which means hatred of Jews. Shem is the, the Hebrew word that means name. To be Semitic is to be in this line of Shem. So anti-Semitism is anti or hatred of that line of people. Now, we've all heard the story, Noah and the ark. What do we need as adults to learn? Let's finish with some thoughts. You see four of them on the screen. The flood demonstrates God's hatred of sin and the certainty of his judgment on it. God giving 120 years to repent before judgment came demonstrates his patience toward people in dealing with sin. Number three, the sparing of one's family demonstrates God's saving grace and the flood reveals God's rule over nature and over humanity. Now, we need to talk about one more thing before we finish because I've had a lot of questions about Bible prophecy during these days. And we'll do another teaching series on prophecy, I promise. But let me show you on the screen a few words from Jesus himself, Matthew 24. Jesus told his disciples, of that day and that hour, no one knows. People are asking all the time, is Jesus coming soon? Is the rapture coming soon? Of that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the son but the father of alone, alone for the coming of the son of man will be just like the days of Noah for as in those days before the blood before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying giving in marriage and until the day that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away so will the coming of the son of man be there will be two men in the field one will be taken or judged Like those not in the ark, one will be left or preserved like those in the ark. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Verse 42 of Matthew 24, Jesus said, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will come. If you believe we live in the last days, and I believe we live in the last days, then Jesus said, you know what the last days are going to look like? They're going to look like the days of Noah. And now you know what the days of Noah look like. 
So as we sit here in the world seeing so much evil and so many storms in our culture, how should we respond? Well, what did Noah show us? Genesis 8 verse 15, God said to Noah, go out of the ark. Take the next step. The question is, will we obey God? Will we take the next step that he gives us? And then in Later in chapter 8, what is his response to God's grace? He built that altar to the Lord. In the middle of the evil, in the middle of the storms, will we obey God and will we worship God? And if you and I believe that we live in the days of the preceding the coming of the Lord, the last days, and we believe it is like the days of Noah, said Jesus, then I want to show you one last screen. Remember I told you we are in the 10th generation of human history from Adam to Noah, 10 generations. If you look on the screen, you will see the names of the 10 generations in English, of course in Hebrew as well, and you will see the Hebrew meaning of the names of these 10 generations in order. Ha-Adam, Adam's name means man. His name is the man, Ha-Adam. So the first man's name means man. Okay, then you have Seth. The meaning is placed or appointed. Enosh, mortal. Canaan, sorrow. Mahalel, blessed God. Jared shall come down. Enoch, teaching or anointed. Methuselah, the oldest man who ever lived. His death will bring is the meaning of his name. Lamech or Lamech, despairing. Noah, his name means rest or comfort. Put all 10 names in a line in one sentence and look at the right. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. 10 generations of names in order. The first 10 generations of human history, they tell the story of Messiah coming to earth. Why? Because the same God who created this universe, the same God who created the earth and recreated the earth, the same God who brought judgment but offered the chance for repentance in the days of Noah, he will also bring judgment in our day, but he offers repentance in our day. It's the same God. Same judgment, but same offer of mercy as well. Will we be the ones to walk blamelessly with our God even in a sinful world? Will we be like Noah? Let's pray, please. Our God, this is our prayer that you would allow us to walk with you, to be blameless, to be righteous before you, to obey you, to trust you, and to tell your story to a world who is so full of people who reject you. And Father, we don't deserve your grace, but we have received your grace, so may we now teach someone else how to find that grace. And thank you that from the very beginning you promised to be the redeemer, to come to earth, to bring comfort and rest. And we know that we find that in Messiah Jesus. So God, help us to live through the storm And hold on to you every step of the way. And even in the storm, will we worship you? That is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to thank you for being with us today. Blessings to you. Remember, we have adult small groups meeting here on campus and online and in homes. We'd love to share with you those if you'd like to. The offering boxes are on the exit doors as you leave. If you'd like to give online, firstmelissa.com slash give. Thank you for being here in the room. Thank you for joining us online. We'll continue next week. See you then.